and um, welcome to folks from far away. I think I saw some uh, Australian names in there. <laughs> so great to have you with us. Um, and Europe, maybe it's a little late, but excuse me just a second. I'm, I've got slightly uh, new gear here. So, okay, so um, I think you can probably hear me better than previously. Is, is, it, is it sounding okay? I mean, you're hearing me okay? Yeah, okay, good. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start now. Um, <clears throat> you know, our, our point, our purpose in this practice is to is to be here. Perhaps we could say more fully. It's to, it's to be here and find out more of what, what's really happening here, now, being human consciousness in human body. You know, many of you know the story of Gensha, for example, who had the sense that he he wasn't really getting anywhere in his practice and he left the monastery he'd been training in, stubbed his toe on a rock, famous story, you know, hurt himself very badly. But right then he had this profound shift in the way he experienced being alive. It's just one of many stories in the Zen tradition, but it expresses what, in a way, Zen has attempted to pass on. You know, it's nothing to do with Zen. I mean, Zen doesn't own it. Zen isn't anything more than a sometimes successful method for coming to know our experience here and now in a different way, in a deeper, truer way, more real, more true. And um, it's really important that we don't forget that, that we don't get caught in words. This practice is not about words. It's trying to convey something that you don't need this practice to, to convey. People occasionally randomly discover this without practice. Practice doesn't own it. Practice isn't necessary for it. But practice can help. It can make it more likely that we'll have this kind of discovery in our lives. And it can certainly make it more likely that we'll be able to live what we discover if we have this kind of experience. Practice can definitely help quite significantly with that, Zen style and other styles. But I wanna, I wanna say something actually <clears throat> about this next retreat we're having. You see, because of that focus of Zen on sort of, um, you know, what we call Kensho, the, this uh, realization of who and what we are in a totally different way, total uh, re, reappraisal, re, you know, shift is a mild word, but it, it is a shift, but it's a totally new way of experiencing this very moment. Just, you know, what you are in this moment. Because of having some focus on that, sometimes called principle in the Zen tradition. Um, because of that, you know, in our line, which has been one, I think, very uh, rightly sort of uh, uh, 
bringing forward this old focus of Zen, you know, from the Chinese ancestors onward of making this discovery. That's the principle. Because of that focus, you know, when when uh, we when we teach the sort of the basics of practice, I'm not sure we do a very good job, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> the reason I say that is like in our in the introductory talks that we've inherited, which were created in the 1940s, um, when introductory talks in Zen were kind of a new idea. I mean, prior to that, the Zen model was, if you're lucky enough to be permitted entry to the monastery or the temple, you're just put on a cushion and told to sit still. And that's it. End of instruction. You know, but in the 1940s, when Zen was opening up to more lay people or had a new wave of opening up, because it had been quite a lay, a lay person's practice at various points in its history, throughout its history, really. Um, but, you know, there, some, a set of introductory talks was created by one of the ancestors in our lineage. And... Um, in there is a document, one of the tours, called The Three Aims of Zen. And um, the first aim in that scheme is samadhi. Um, well, actually, that's not consistent with many other paths of meditation practice. Samadhi is regarded as rather an advanced meditative attainment and um, that comes after other ones. So I wanted, I wanted to introduce uh, tonight just a little sort of foretaste of next week because next week is really focusing on samadhi, and, I mean, uh, which has different meanings and different translations in, in different traditions. So I, so I thought I'd just say a little bit about where it fits in, in a sort of overall scheme of meditation practice. Samadhi means something like uh, bringing together, holding together, unifying. It's sometimes called unification, um, translated that way. And there are various, many, various kinds of Samadhi in Buddhism, actually even in Zen and in other traditions. And, but just to give you a sort of sense of where it fits in schemes, like, you know, in, the, in yoga, traditional old yoga, there are eight limbs of yoga. And um, they only, only really the last, I suppose basically the last five of the eight limbs are to do with meditation. The first is pranayama, that that's the fourth limb of yoga, which is breath exercises. Very smart, actually, to do some of those uh, as a sort of precursor to meditation, but we don't really do that in, in Zen. Don't really do it in Buddhism, generally. Uh, you know, this is, this is not just following breath, it's deliberate exercises. Um, then there's Pratyahara, this is the eight limbs of yoga. The, the, the fourth limb is Pranayama, the fifth is Pratyahara, which is withdrawal of senses. It means um, becoming, it can be physically more secluded, but it also means as you sit, uh, becoming less outwardly drawn, more inwardly focused. Um, then there's dharana, which is concentration, which mostly means concentrating on an object. Then there's dhyana, which means, actually in this scheme, it, it's usually taken to mean meditation. Uh, dhyana has a different meaning in Buddhism. Some of these points actually get, it's confusing because different traditions have different meanings of these things. But in yoga, dhyana tends to just mean meditation. And then the last limb of yoga is samadhi. And actually, I'm, excuse me, I'm just going to read off my screen some translations of samadhi in the yogic sense. It means oneness with the subject of meditation. There's no distinction between the 
actor of meditation, the act of meditation, and the subject of meditation. Samadhi is that spiritual state where one's mind is so absorbed in whatever it is contemplating that the mind loses the sense of its own identity. The thinker, the thought process, and the thought fuse. There's only oneness. Well, in Buddhism, actually, that just isn't how samadhi is understood. Samadhi is understood in Buddhism to be concentration, gathering together, unification, uh, not of subject and object, but basically of subject, becoming unified in yourself. And um, it's, it's uh, for example, in the Eightfold Path, it is actually the eighth fold in the eightfold path so again it's quite a you know sort of a it, it's not a it's not an initial practice it's not an it's it's not something that we expect to hop into straight away when you begin your sitting um so Actually, if I just fill it out in the Eightfold Path, the sixth fold is right effort, which is about meditation. It's about coming to know wholesome and unwholesome states of mind and essentially have less of the unwholesome ones and more of the wholesome ones. That's right effort. Sixth fold in the Eightfold Path. The seventh fold is mindfulness. Mindfulness of the present moment without judgment, being able to let this moment be just as it is. Letting it be just as it is. No great sort of, you know, fireworks, no great insight that, you know, I am one with everything or no, none of that. Just letting the moment be as it is. Becoming comfortable in your skin i mean that that's a big deal for many of us to be here letting things be as they are mindfulness and then samadhi meaning concentration in fact there's you know there's a sequence of factors by which samadhi concentration is said to develop um, now again in Zen as we're as it's come down to us we we just jump we're supposed to jump straight to Samadhi it's not maybe quite so uh, helpful for everybody to view it that way I mean you can see where it comes from because really the Emphasis is just, you know, um, making this leap into discovery of who and what we are in a whole new way. So with that in mind, why waste time on these sort of earlier things in practice? But, you know, actually, really, they're rather important. And, you know, here at Mountain Cloud, we have, we have this uh, great, deep, powerful, I, I think, you know, Zen way. Tremendous, tremendous way. Just, just, I mean, it's not the Zen, once again. Zen is merely a method, a means for opening up wildly to what we are much, much more than we ordinarily know. Right here, right now. It's that, but somehow, you know, the whole human with, with all our travails and our challenges and our hindrances and stuff may not be terribly well 
met merely by that. So we've had at Mountain Cloud this really fantastic, I think, program, a Rio Grande Mindfulness Institute, spearheaded from the start by John Brayman, with a little bit of input from me, and now also with support from Yvonne Sebastian, crucial support and help there. Um, and it's a mindfulness program for, for people who might not otherwise come to meditation. And um, I've been feeling over the last year or so, maybe longer, that um, actually all of us need some of this sort of more foundational practice. So we've had these retreats. I've been sort of evolving, original love. That's the name I've given them. Uh, I mean, they could also be called foundations of practice, I think. Um, to try to kind of fill the gap really between what RGMI is doing and what the hardcore Zen is doing. Seems to me there's a sort of, there's a, there's a, a meeting is needed sort of between those. So original love retreats have been attempting to sort of fill that gap. Um, and therefore have been um, coming in with looking at sort of a little more what, happens before samadhi so we've been you know first one first sort of zone we're looking at is, is basically mindfulness then having trust in practice not feeling it's all down to us that's sort of a counteractive to mindfulness which seems to be practice that we're, we kind of have to really work on that ourselves and then this coming one is more focus on the samadhi, you know, with some, with some deep guidance into an exploration of what samadhi is all about. Um, so I hope that that, uh, you know, just gives you a little bit of a taste of what's, what's coming there. Um, I'm, uh, um, I'm happy that this is the way we're going, but I, I have to acknowledge at the same time, it's still true that no map really, in some sense, no map can be right. No map of practice. Why? Because because it's all about now, now. Just this. There's no map to just this. You know, we could, we could just say, just this. And what is our resistance to just this? Can we track any? Can we find any resistance? Somehow, some pulling back from just this, just as it is. Somehow, some trace of wanting something else. Can we, can we, do we find that? So then that's our practice, just to be with those things since they're arising now. It's enough. Um, now, on that score, I actually want to read a bit from a beautiful new book that is coming out next year early on haiku by a friend of Mountain Cloud, Natalie Goldberg. I thought I would quote a bit because this is, you know, haiku, of course, have an intimate relationship with Zen practice 
over the last whatever three 350 years or something like that since haiku really emerged on their own as a form form of poetry yes but also a form of practice one of these masters um buson uh, it was a 18th century haiku master he wrote uh, an essay in which he he quoted a student a haiku student who who called shoha who asked him about haiku so i'm gonna just this is my quotation from natalie goldberg's new book three simple lines on haiku so actually i'm giving you a kind of advanced sneak preview this is now natalie goldberg quoting Busson. So this is Busson's words in his kind of memoir, essay. One day he questioned me again. This is the student. Since old times, there have been many different gateways to haiku and each is different. Which gateway shall I enter to reach the pavilion's innermost room? And then this is Busson's answer. There is only the haiku gateway itself. There is only the haiku gateway itself. See, this is, this is like Zen. You know, how do you prepare for Zen? Only by doing Zen. Think for yourself about what you have inside yourself. There is no other way. But still, if you don't choose appropriate friends to communicate with, it's difficult to reach that world. So Shoha, the student, asked, who are the friends? And Busan answers, call on Kikaku, visit Renetsu, recite with Sodo. These are all actually former poets who were all associated with that other great earlier haiku master, Basho, who's the most famous, probably, haiku master. And he goes on, day after day, you should meet these old poets, meaning, I guess he means sort of read them, reflect on their words, and get away from the distracting atmosphere of the cities, wander around forests, and drink and talk in the mountains. It is best if you acquire haiku naturally thus should you spend every day and someday you will meet those poets again your appreciation of nature will be unchanged then you will close your eyes and seek for words when you get haiku you will open your eyes suddenly the poets will have disappeared you stand there alone in an ecstasy at that time Flower fragrance comes with the wind and moonlight hovers on the water. This is the world of haiku. Shoha, the student, smiled. It's, you get the flavors rather zen-like, you know, isn't it? That we're, we're, it's all about this life meeting this life. I'm going to read you another bit. That uh, they're in a little rundown temple at this point in Japan. Natalie and uh, a couple of friends traveling with her. And they're, they're meet, they've met with a, a master called Harada and his son Taiseki and and another monk. So there's several of them in the Zendo. And, and one of them, um, actually the son of the master, asks, uh, what are these three Americans doing in Japan anyway? These, Natalie and her friends are traveling around. And their interpreter friend answers, they're following in Basho's footsteps. This is Basho, this great haiku master, famously made various 
long journeys around Japan. Um, and then he says something, and a Mitsue, our friend, turns to me and says, Taiseki wants to hear a haiku, one of Basho's. So Natalie writing here says, I nod, stand up tall, and recite in English. I enunciate each word carefully, wondering, wanting to express my love and respect for Basho in this chilly, echoing temple. Here's Basho's haiku that she quotes. Sick on the journey, my dreams wander over withered fields. Again, sick on the journey, my dreams wander over withered fields. This is Basho's death haiku. Mitsue translates as I tell the story behind it. Basho had been on a pilgrimage visiting the southern coast of Lake Biwa when he became ill with a stomach ailment. So he detoured to nearby Osaka to a friend's home. It was autumn and he must have been aware of his approaching death. At his friend's home, he went to bed. Many of Basho's disciples heard about his illness, hurried to Osaka and gathered at his bedside. He was calm as he wrote a note to his elder brother. I'm sorry to have to leave you now. According to a disciple's record, he thought only of poetry day and night. Poetry became an obsession, a sinful attachment, as ba Basho himself called it. Even when he should have been attending to his approaching death, he wrote haiku. But maybe the disciple was wrong, I tell the group or at least short-sighted. Maybe writing haiku was exactly the proper thing for Basho to do on his deathbed. I take out of my backpack the book I have about Busson and read what Busson said during his own final days. Even being sick like this, my fond, my fond, excuse me, even being sick like this, my fondness for the way is beyond reason, and I try to make haiku. The heights of my dreams hover over withered fields. Basho's last haiku is impossible for me to reach. Therefore, the old poet Basho's greatness is supremely moving to me now. I'm slightly embarrassed by my enthusiasm but the reason I'm so up on this last Basho haiku is that I've been intensely studying it after reading Basho, Busson's comment, and yet I don't quite get it. Why is it so great? This line, my dreams wander over withered fields, or my dreams hover over withered fields. What's so great? Immediately, a lively discussion flies back and forth across the altar room among Harada, Taiseki, and Mitsue. After more than a minute, Mitsue turns to me and says, it's not withered fields, poor translation. No, what is it? They confer again for a long time. It seems this is important to the three of them. Mitsue then explains something much wilder. After everything has died and it's all removed, the stubble, everything, the fields are totally empty, truly vast. I take a step back, tears spring to my eyes. On his deathbed, Basho embraced the whole impermanent field of the universe. So, you know, just looking at that again, he's sick on the journey. My dreams wander over the empty fields or something. Fields that are, you know, fields after the harvest vast and empty, something like that. But what a, what a beautiful thing to be just attending to beautiful haiku, just attending to what haikus attend to, just this moment, just this moment. Each one is like a perfect 
moment that returns us to the very moment in which we savor it. Bringing us back to right now. Yeah, so um, hope you'll enjoy this book when it, when it comes out early next year. Um, hold on just a sec. Yeah, I think we'll we'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you, uh, Peg, for leading us tonight. And thank you, Christian, for announcements. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>